What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. I'm helping you pass your NCLEX and your nursing exams like a boss. And today we're gonna to be talking about oxygenation on arterial blood gases. So let's talk about the process of oxygenation. So deoxygenated blood comes from the pulmonary artery to the capillary beds surrounding the alveoli sac. So oxygen crosses that capillary bed via transportation of the red blood cells, right? The red blood cells main job is to pick up that oxygen that comes into the alveoli in exchange for the carbon dioxide of the deoxygenated blood picked up from the tissues. So oxygenated blood continues through the pulmonary vein and is pumped out to the body. This vulvar stance between oxygen and carbon dioxide continues when our lungs and our body are healthy and able to maintain oxygenation. So let's talk about the difference when it comes to partial pressure of oxygen versus saturation of oxygen. When it comes to both, it's really the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in arterial blood. But when it comes to partial pressure of oxygen, or PaO2, that's the gas exchange that occurs within our lungs versus our saturation of oxygen is the gas exchange that occurs in our hemoglobin and our tissues. So partial pressure of oxygen is what you're going to get on an ABG when you're looking at what's happening with the exchange in our lungs. Whereas the saturation of oxygen is what you're gonna get on that little finger probe that we put on our patients. That's the gas exchange that occurs with the hemoglobin and tissue. So changes in oxygenation, specifically lower levels, are going to cause dyspnea, tachypnea, because we're trying to compensate for those lower levels, cyanosis, as well as cool skin. So let's talk about something that's very important when it comes to oxygenation on arterial blood gases, and that is our PF ratio. So our PF ratio is the ratio of arterial oxygen partial pressure, which is our PaO2 in our millimeters of mercury that we talked about before, to fraction inspired oxygen, FiO2 expresses a fraction, not a percentage, um, when it comes to our arterial blood gases. So it provides insight on how our patients are oxygenating. And we do this based on this formula. So our PaO2 is divided by our FiO2, which is equal to our PF ratio. So our normal PaO2 is between 80 to 100 millimeters per mercury. And our normal FiO2 ranges between 21% to 100%. So that's how much fraction-inspired oxygen that we're providing to our patients. So we know that 21% is what we breathe in the atmosphere. So there's approximately 21% oxygen in the atmosphere that we breathe in, in addition to other elements and those things. So that's how we configure our FiO2. So it becomes, it really becomes a decimal when we're looking at it. So our PF ratio, a normal PF ratio needs to be above 300. Once we fall in that 200 to 300 range, we start to experience mild acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we're starting to have impaired exchange when it comes to our oxygenation. Once we get into the 100, 200 range, we start to see moderate ARDS, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. A lot of times patients, depending on what's going on, depending on how severe that distress is, um, this is usually where we're looking at um, mechanically ventilating them. We can even mechanically ventilate them in mild ARDS, depending on what other factors are going on with our patients. And then if we have a value of less than 100, then we have severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute uh, severe ARDS. And when we're in this stage, we're usually proning our patients, we're putting them on their tummies, they're having tummy time, they are... Um, they have neuromuscular blockades on, which completely inhibits their ability to move. They're ex extremely sedated. We do not want them awake during this. Um, outcomes when it comes to severe ARDS aren't as good when it comes to the other ARDS. ARDS in general isn't great, but we can see better outcomes in mild and moderate ARDS. Once we're in severe ARDS, uh, patients typically don't make it or they don't have good, um, they have long lasting um, deficits because of the medications and those things that we help you know, keep them alive. 
So is saturation of oxygen in arterial blood reliable? Well, many abnormal body processes can affect the SAO2 reliability. That's our acid base imbalances that we talked about with our respiratory metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Anemia is another huge one. It affects the hemoglobin's ability to carry oxygen. So the SAO2 is usually within the reference range. However, the arterial oxygen content, because there's less RBCs, less hemoglobin is reduced. So many may have a SAO2 of 95%, but it's based on a 50% reduction of red blood cells. So tissues are not being oxygenated appropriately, which will ultimately affect the SAO2. Uh, peripheral temperature and perfusion, the temperature of the skin and perfusion, particularly in patients who have peripheral vascular disease may affect the SAO2. And temperature, of course, as we have fluctuations in temperatures, such as high fevers and sepsis, it's going to affect, affect the hemoglobin's ability to deliver oxygen. So as the body is burning up, oxygen is being burnt up very quickly and it's unable to reach the tissues. So the body is trying to throw all of this oxygen to our tissues, but that extreme heat is burning up that oxygen before it can even get to where it needs to be. So that's ultimately also going to affect our SAO2. So our SAO2 and PaO2 are late indicators that something is wrong. You're going to see carbon dioxide changes well before you even see oxygenation changes when it comes to those two values. So what I always highly recommend, is, especially if you've got a um, at-risk population, is to throw them on a, um, a CO2 detector. So usually it can be on the finger. If they're mechanically ventilated, it's attached to that. It lets us know what they are exhaling when it comes to the CO2. Because you could, again, have somebody who's 95% when it comes to their saturation of oxygen, but they can have a CO2 of 65 because the body is trying to compensate for that. So I highly recommend if we have at-risk populations that you throw them on that detector to make sure that it's um, accurate and that we don't have some underlying cause taking place that we could fix way ahead of time before we start to see changes in that SAO2. So when it comes to oxygenation compromise changes, we've got early signs of hypoxemia. Um, mental status changes is huge. Restlessness, agitation, irritability, confusion. Remember the brain is very sensitive to pH changes and oxygenation changes. So you're going to start to see mental status changes um, very quickly when it comes to hypoxemia. Vital signs are going to be high because the body is trying to get that oxygen, it's trying to compensate. So you're going to see that tachypnea, tachycardia, hypertension, all of those things are going to try to push that blood fast um, and that oxygen fast to our tissues. And lastly, patient positioning. So you can see accessory muscle use, paradoxal breathing, and even tripoding um, where the patient's kind of bent over on their um, table, on their uh, bedside table. They're just trying to breathe. They're just trying to get as much alveolar recruitment to get all of that oxygen to their tissues. Um, that's called tripoding with our um, oxygen compromised patients. So when it comes to late signs of hypoxemia, when it comes to oxygenation compromise changes, our vital signs are going to start to become low because the body is only unable to compensate for those changes in oxygen for so long before it starts to tire out. So our respiratory rate, our heart rate, and our blood pressure are all going to be low. You're going to start to see skin changes, cyanosis because of that lack of oxygenation to our tissues. So you can start to see it around the lips, you can see it in the mucosa membranes, you can see it in our nail beds. Um, they'll start to turn blue as that cyanosis continues and the oxygenation becomes worse. And then lastly, ECG changes. So you're going to see dysrhythmias due to the, de the decrease in oxygen delivery to the heart. So as the body is trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen within the system, it's going to start shunting all of that oxygen and that blood to our vital organs. Well, what are our vital organs? We have our brain, our heart, and our lungs. So everything else starts to take a hit. 
So you're gonna start to see low urine outputs because the kidneys are taking a hit from having those low um, oxygenations. You're gonna see uh, constipation because the gut isn't getting oxygenated so it's not gonna be functioning appropriately. And once we have used up the oxygen and we no longer have oxygen for our vital organs, you're going to start to see dysrhythmias because now the vital organs aren't able to get enough oxygen. So again, oxygen is extremely important when it comes to functions for our body systems. So what is oxygenation management gonna look like when we have a patient who is experiencing oxygenation compromise? Well, again, we wanna treat the underlying cause. It doesn't matter what we do if we're not treating what's causing the problem. So we're going to administer oxygenation when needed. We're gonna provide the FiO2 that we talked about before when oxygen saturations fall below normal. And that's usually less than 92 to 94 percent dependent on what your facility's policy is regarding normal saturation of oxygen. Supplemental oxygen is used for patients who are able to maintain their airway, so airway compromise um, will not be treated based on supplemental oxygen alone. If they've got airway compromise, we're most likely going to have to mechanically ventilate these patients. And with mechanical ventilation, we use it for our severe respiratory distress like we talked about before with our ARDS patients. Um, airway compromise and potential obstruction um, depending on what that underlying cause is. And lastly, we can give blood transfusions if blood loss is the cause of oxygenation compromise because those blood transfusions will help treat the anemia um, and also help uh, with oxygenation by having more red blood cells readily available to have the oxygen attached to the hemoglobin and distribute it to the rest of the body. I hope that this video was helpful in helping pass your arterial blood gas, nursing school exams, as well as your NCLEX like a boss. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you subscribe here to my YouTube and hit that notification bell so that way you're informed every time I post a new video. You can also follow me on my social media. I am on Facebook and Instagram and make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com. There I'm going to have NCLEX style questions, resources, handouts, everything you need to pass those exams like a boss. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will see you all again soon. Bye.